Okay, good morning, everyone. My name is Jennifer Reed, and I'm the director of Bridgewater State University Senior College. Thank you so much for being here for with us this morning for this special event with Dr. Roger Landry. I'm so thrilled to have him here um, to be able to offer this presentation today, and we'll talk a little bit more about um, what he's planning on doing with us today. But before that, I just wanted to make a couple of announcements. So the first one is that um, registration for the winter spring semester is now open um, and you can sign up for classes. So you might have already received one or two emails from me this morning. Um, I sent an email specific to people that were members in the fall. So you probably got that this morning. And if everyone could just stay on mute that would be super helpful. Um, I can hit the mute all button again, which I will do. Um, so it's open. We have everything posted on our website and I will put the, the link to the website in the chat when I'm done speaking. And so we're really thrilled. Um, courses start on, let's see, they start on February 2nd. So we have just a couple of weeks to get everyone signed up. And we have, we will offer 10 in-person classes this semester at the Bridgewater Public Library, the Center for Active Living in Plymouth, and BSU Attleboro. And of course, we will adhere to whatever the public health protocol is at the moment. Um, you do have to be vaccinated, fully vaccinated and boosted to be a member of senior college who takes in-person classes. So we'll, we'll talk to you more as we get closer to that. So that will be a requirement for the in-person people. And the in-person will depend, of course, on how many people sign up. And if classes are, you know, if we're not seeing the enrollment in those in-person classes, we might have to shift them to virtual. And the good thing is all of the instructors who are planning on offering in-person classes classes are um, willing to just switch right to virtual. It'll be at the same um, exact time and dates and all that. So we're really excited that we have a great solid backup plan if needed. And we um, will offer 22 courses this semester that are fully virtual on Zoom. And as many of you might remember, we have expanded our classes. So normally we only offered four week classes for one hour in duration. And now they will all, for the most part, there's a couple exceptions, but for the most part, they'll all be six week classes and they'll take place for an hour and 20 minutes. So although it seems like we have less courses, we really have built a schedule that is more robust, more in depth. And I think um, based on your feedback, I think a lot of you will enjoy being able to have an opportunity to learn in a format where the classes are um, more robust. I, I get a lot of messages from you all saying four weeks was not enough um, with the particular instructor. So the other thing is we have lots of new and exciting courses planned. I listened to your feedback. I brought back a few of our superstars who we all know and love and want to learn more from. And then I listened and we brought, but brought in some really new and exciting um, instructors. So both full-time faculty from Bridgewater State University, some part-time faculty from Bridgewater University, State University, and also some great local people like local experts or people from other institutions. So take a look at the course catalog. Again, I'll put the link in the chat when I'm done and uh, we can take it from there. There is a couple of other events coming up that I want to mention to you. So the first is, um, and these are all free and open to the public, on Wednesday, February 2nd, we have a um, event on new advances in Alzheimer's treatment that's in partnership with the Alzheimer's Association, Massachusetts and New Hampshire chapter. Uh, that's February 2nd, 10 to 11. And then we also have an event the, on February 15th, and I'll put all this in the chat when I'm done speaking. Um, on the 10 warning signs of Alzheimer's. And then we have three open houses coming up. Uh, the first one is this Wednesday at 6.30 p.m. The second one is Tuesday, February 1st, 1 p.m. And then Wednesday, February 9th at um, uh, 10 a.m. So I'm actually just gonna link to our website right now. So if you wanna click over there and find all that information, you can do that. Okay, so I'm just looking at my notes here to make sure I've covered everything. So 
The point of our event today is to have a great conversation with Dr. Roger Landry. I got to know him through a colleague of mine, and he came and spoke at the Cape Cod um, Technology Council. I happen to be the president of the board of that organization, and it was a very uh, dynamic, interesting conversation. So as soon as that was done, I reached out to him and see, to see if he would be willing to come and speak to all of you. And I'm thrilled that he said yes. It's very exciting. So. Um, I'd like to give you a little bit of background about him, um, and then I will just go over the parameters of today's event, and we can take it from there. Just making sure I'm letting everyone into the waiting room. Okay. Um, so Dr. Roger Landry is a preventative medicine physician, and he's the author of an award-winning book called Live Long, Die Short, A Guide to Authentic Health and Successful Aging. He's also the president of an organization called Masterpiece Living, which is a organization that has multidisciplined specialists in aging who partner with communities to assist them in becoming destinations for continued growth. He was trained at Tufts University Medical School and Harvard University School of Public Health, and he specializes, specializes in building environments that empower older adults to maximize their unique potential. He was also an expert contributor to the recently published 80 Things to Do When You Turn 80. I love that. And he was also a flight surgeon in the Air Force for more than 22 years. Thank you so much for your service, Dr. Landry. Um, and he, kept, he worked hard to keep pilots and other crew, air crew healthy and performing at their best. Today, Dr. Landry has a planned presentation for all of us. Um, hold on, I'm just exiting the full screen and making sure I'm muting all. If you could just stay on mute, that would be helpful. He has a planned presentation and I would encourage you to type out your questions in the chat, make them public, don't just send them privately to me. So that way, if there's any themes coming up, I can kind of th synthesize your questions and ask him at the end. So feel free to type in the chat and let us know questions as he goes along, but he certainly will stay at the conclusion of his PowerPoint and offer um, Q&A. And at that time, if you wanna ask him a question in person, you can unmute yourself and do that as well. All right, that was a lot. Sorry, that took 10 minutes. I didn't mean that to take 10 minutes. Um, Dr. Landry, you will have to unmute yourself and um, I'll hand the reins over to you now. Thank you. Well, thank you, Jen. And uh, technology being the way it is, I'm going to have to go out and then go back in sharing my screen because it won't uh, progress. But, but oh, there it is. It will. Technology, you know. <laughs> uh, thank you for the introduction. Very kind. Most of it's true. And uh, I, uh, I'm particularly pleased because, as Jen mentioned, although I'm in Colorado, you can see the sun's just coming up over here. You can see it on the fireplace. I live in Falmouth. This is Knobs Light at Falmouth. And so uh, this is particularly uh, kind of peaceful and very homey for me, uh, being with uh, those that uh, my neighbors, really, most of you. C congratulations on what you do. Uh, I, Jen has told me about senior college. And although I'm going to be talking about healthy longevity, it's clear to me just by virtue of the fact that you're here that you're paying attention to this. So perhaps what this will be uh, will be at least a validation, but I think you'll find some new things and some, uh, some research that will be of interest to you and also uh, an approach to healthy longevity that, uh, that may be of help. That's my plan and I'm sticking to it. So we're living longer, right? That's great with technology is allowing us to do it, but you know, there's no guarantee about what that longevity will be. And unfortunately, this is the path that most people are taking right now. They're born, they're, they become their best all under the shaded area. And then because we're living longer, there's this long period of steady decline, which is expensive and painful and uh, not any not lower quality of life, not something we're really thinking about doing. You know, we, that is not our plan. So what if we could do, what is healthy longevity? Well, it's this dotted line where basically we're able to stay at high levels of function longer and longer and longer. So that little dip there, even when life throws us curveballs, we all know life throws us curveballs, uh, that we're able to bounce back, maybe not to where we were, but at least be able to bounce back to where we're stable again and are able to continue on at, at, at the very highest level that we can be. Now, what we really want to do is what Ashley Montague told us to do. And he said, die young. 
as late as possible. <laughs> so that's what we're talking about here. So that's possible now. I mean, uh, maybe 20, 25 years ago, they would have said, no, nah, it's in the genes. You know, there's not a whole lot you can do about it. But the MacArthur study in Chicago did a 10 year long study at the end of the last century and found for the first time, this was, uh, this was an actual seminal work, that it was lifestyle that was the major determinant in how we age, the choices that we made every day, never too late, never too early to make a big difference. And uh, that has been validated since by all the, all the research that uh, has followed, lifestyle as the major determinant. So that means you're in charge, can't blame your parents. In fact, as you get older, the, the genetic component, which is around 30% or so, gets even less influential in, in our aging path. Now, you may have heard of the blue zones, uh, and here is a living laboratory for what this is all about. Uh, in uh, the blue zones are an areas identified by Dave Butner in, in his books and in his original National Geographic study. He, he was looking for places where people live to be old, but were very vital, you know, this healthy longevity thing. And he found these five places in, uh, in the world. He called them blue zones. And uh, again, these people were aging, but they were vital and living and engaged. And so he studied them. You know, a lot of them, you know, we can't know, we don't know too much about, but many are islands or peninsulas, but Loma Linda, California, that's in Southern California. They're crazy in Southern California. <laughs> I've lived there. And how could that be a blue zone? Well, you may know that Loma Linda is, uh, there is a very large population of Seventh-day Adventists. And they, they are very strong on their lifestyle and how they live. And it's very similar to these other areas. And so here we have a laboratory in the middle of where we're not aging successfully in general and to see that. So what are the characteristics? Because we want to know. They move. You know, 99% of the time that we've been on earth as humans, we were hunter gatherers. I know that's hard to wrap your head around, but 99% of the time we were hunter gatherers. So our lifestyle for most of the time we've been on earth was hunter gatherer. They moved, you know, there's still tribes today and they can take up to 23,000 steps a day, you know, compared to our 10, which we shoot for, which is great. But that is who we are. That is still ingrained in our DNA because although society has changed, our, our DNA and our needs do not change so quickly. Strong social support. You know, we, we survived as humans because we banded together. And in these blue zones, people have very, very strong social connections. They have a role. They always have a role. Down below, you'll see elders of, of, are considered cultural treasures. How's that, huh? because they have a role in society. They're expected to give back. They get a lot of uh, reverence, of course, for who they are and their experience. But it is, it is the role, in fact, that elders played in societies up until the Industrial Revolution. So that was just like yesterday in our time on Earth, the Industrial Revolution. And yet that changed the role of elders and elders. Uh, there's a slower pace to life. Some, in, in, uh, in some of these places, they don't even pay attention to the clock. If they say, I'll see you for lunch, that could be anywhere from three hours in a three hour window. When I lived in Asia, it was very similar to that in the Philippines. They eat primarily a Mediterranean diet, uh, fruits, nuts, vegetables, wild grains, fish, and small amounts of meat, uh, which we have rediscovered as the great diet. But in fact, that's what we have been eating as a species for all the time we've been on earth, basically except these last few years, the last since the Industrial Revolution, last three centuries. Again, I talked about everyone having a role, including the older adult, including the older adult. And they were close to nature. Nature wasn't any place you visited. This was who we were. We were, it was our living room. And, you know, we shared the DNA. We, we share 25% of our DNA with a, with a daffodil. And fruit trees, it gets up to 60%. Mammals, even higher, and I don't even want to tell you what bonobo apes share with us, because it'll freak you out. So here is a living laboratory for a lifestyle. Now, it's also possible that why lifestyle is, so, is a major determinant, because of what we discovered. Dr. Elizabeth Blackburn is a she's head of the Salt Clinic now. She's an Australian. She won the Nobel Prize for her study on telomeres. Maybe one of your classes talked about telomeres. 
that stained chromosome there, the end, the, the green, that's a telomere. And that protects the DNA material, which is the other color. I only had eight crayons in my box at school, so I don't know what color that is. <laughs> <laughs> but the green I know, and, and that's the DNA. So when the cell divides, a little is lost. So if that's DNA, the cell dies. And so these telomeres protect, it's like the end of a shoelace. What we see is that when people live a lifestyle that we're talking about, those telomeres stay longer, longer. Cells live longer, organs live longer, organisms live longer. That's not enough for you. There's a whole new field of epigenetics. And this is the study of our gene expression. And so now we can map the human genome. So we can map someone's genome and know all the genes that are there. And we can look at it and say, oh, ooh, there's a bad gene. That gene is associated with some bad disease. And we can get a bunch of those people together who have that gene. One, some of them live this lifestyle, some live this lifestyle. And you know what we have found with epigenetics? That lifestyle affects the expression of the gene. So you can have a bad gene, but it'll just lay there dormant in many cases if we live a certain lifestyle, which we're talking about, you know, moving, learning, staying socially connected, having meaning and purpose, those sort of, and diet. Those, those are the things. So there's a lot of reason to believe with research and everything that's found, even since the MacArthur Foundation that lifestyle is the major determinant. And so we're in charge. So we're really talking about building resilience. We all had a crash course in resilience this last two years, didn't we? And resilience is necessary for life, but particularly as we uh, begin to age, as well, we're always aging, but as we get older, uh, resilience is particularly important because those curveballs do come. And whether we bounce back, that's, that's resilience if we bounce back. So today um, I wrote a book about this, but uh, these, these 10 tips are out of the book. And so these 10 tips are the way to a healthy longevity, to build resilience. And, but, but before I wanna do anything, I wanna talk about change, especially this time of year uh, in particular, because I don't know how many of you made a new year's resolution. Maybe you, you're, you're at a point in your life where you've made so many, you, your, your resolution this year was to not make any resolutions because we don't do well. Very few people ever uh, succeed, even beyond February, with a New Year's resolution. And there's a reason for that. We inherited from our ancestors a, uh, a reaction to large change. And it's in our brains and it's controlled by an area called the amygdala. It's like a little almond shaped thing. And when we are faced with large change, we respond with a fear response. Because large change for our ancestors usually was, a, was something that was dangerous. And so we're wired to do that, even if the change is self-induced. So when we take, when we decide we're gonna lose 57 pounds by next week, or you know, never drink alcohol again, or you know, some of the outrageous things that we do, maybe not that bad, but our, our, because in, this, in our culture, we don't respect small change, and we only respect braggable change. And we're not gonna walk into a bar and said, I walked 10 more steps last week each day. We wouldn't do that. And so we tend to get take big hunks and we fail. Almost consistently, we are wired to fail. And so there's a book out, Dr. Robert Moore, One, Stro One Small Step Can uh, Change Your Life. And this is about small steps towards big change. So here's how it works. You want to say you want to lose weight. That's a big one. So you want to lose a lot of weight. So I had actually had a patient. I asked him, okay, uh, why do you want to? And he said, you know, when we get over the, you know, look good, maybe be able to do a few things. Well, it usually comes down. He wanted to be able to get up from the floor after playing with his kids. But he also knew it was a health response, he, uh, a health threat. And he wanted to be there for his granddaughter's wedding. And so that was the why. Whys are important because when it going gets tough for, for something we're trying to change, uh, it's easy to get diverted unless we know why and we remember why. So why do we want to change? What do we want to change? And then here comes the key. Ask yourself, what's the smallest thing that I can do to start working to that? Smallest. My, my, my guy I was talking about, Tony said, uh, I don't know, Doc, help me. I said, okay, well, this time I'll help you, but from now on, it's yours. Try standing during TV commercials next week. That was all. He did it. And then he began walking in place. 
And so what, what happened there is that he began to develop confidence and competence that he could change. He didn't, he didn't ignite this uh, fear response in his brain. And he was able, to, as long as you're patient, he was able to take steps. You can take that next step up this mountain, you know, running up, doing the whole thing right away, that would be something, but taking one step and having that as your goal, that is your goal, that first step. Once you achieve that, then you go on to the next one. Occasionally you'd fail. Tony, my patient would fail. We said, oh, Tony, we just did too much. Just ratchet it back. So you can see doing it this way, being patient, you cannot fail. And by the way, the change that you experience will be durable. You can lose a whole bunch of weight by just eating bark or broccoli or whatever and nothing else, but that's not a quality of life you're really looking for. So this, this change will be durable. So with any of these things that I say, if you make a commitment to change, remember small steps, use it or lose. Okay. Now, most of you have heard this, maybe your grandparents told you this, uh, and it, it's kind of intuitive, but this is, this is a, a huge problem. Um, we can't expect to continue to do things that we don't do. Uh, and, you know, maybe we all think it's like riding a bike. Well, even riding a bike, if you don't do it for a long time and you have a balance problem, you're, gonna, you're not going to be able to just jump on a bike. So uh, this is intuitive, but this is, uh, this is what can start. So there you are on your curve, you're growing, you're at the top, and all of a sudden something happens. You know, I don't know if it's a big fracture and a knee problem or a heart attack or something like that. How you respond to that is critical. And we don't plan to, uh, to, to stop doing something, to starting down that decline, down that curve. We don't usually plan that. Oh, I'm, not, I'm gonna do less. Although there are some people that say, oh, I'm 75, I'm 80 now. I'm, not, I'm just gonna sit in a rocker like my grandmother did. That's, that's what older people do. And all the things that happen to them because of that come true. We're, we're more enlightened than that now. But the fact is, is that if uh, we don't choose it, but something happens and how we respond to it. Here's my story. So I was in college in Worcester where I grew up and I was in a bad toboggan accident, really messed up my leg. I uh, had a lot of surgeries in the hospital a long time and I had to drop out of college for a while. And, uh, but they fixed it eventually. But not really. There was, there was a little bit off kilter, my, my leg. And so after 40 years of essentially no limitations, military, athlete, everything, my knee and, and ankle began to really bother me because it wasn't lined up. And so what was happening to me is I get depressed. That's not me. That's not who I am. And this can happen to us in life. Something happens that what? that's not me. And you get depressed. And I wasn't doing much of this. And even if I did do this, I couldn't come up with the word because my mind wasn't working well. I wasn't working out because it hurt. And when I did, I could do that. I was circling the drain. So got the knee fixed pretty easily these days, but the ankle was something else. But eventually, took a while, but I found a surgeon in Boston uh, who fixes the ankles for the Celtics. And I was his 200th ankle replacement. And what that did for my spirit, I started, I it was optimistic. I started doing things and, and it went the other way. So it's how we respond and how we adapt. Because sometimes there's a wall there, but there's usually not a wall that ever stops you completely. Stephen Hawking is an example of that. I mean, look what he was able to achieve when he could only move his lips. I mean, he used technology, but he, he adapted and accommodated. And that's, that's the big thing. So use it or lose it. You know, the Apollo astronaut program, some of you may be too young, some of you may remember, but a couple of those astronauts had to be carried out of the helicopter after they were recovered in a stretcher because they had been in weightlessness for so long, they weren't using their muscles. And so they lost muscle mass, they lost bone density, uh, and they could, some of them couldn't stand up. And that's just in a few weeks. We don't go into weightlessness, but a sedentary lifestyle comes pretty close. So it doesn't take long, you know, it's say you get sick and you lay in bed for a while. Not a good idea these days. You lose a lot. Use it or lose it. Okay, you got to keep moving. We talked about humans as a, a species that moves. Our hunter-gatherer, uh, uh, there's accommodation. Our hunter-gatherer ancestors moved and we have discovered things like, hey, the brain works better when people move. Oh, the GI tract works better when people move. The heart cardiovascular system, everything works better when we move. Notice I'm not saying exercise. 
nothing wrong with exercise. It's wonderful. But that's not what we're really talking about. Because in our culture, you know, we'll go work out for a, an hour or two and then spend the rest of the day in a sedentary race, driving cars, watching TV, working in cubicles, working behind computers. 65% of the average American time awake is behind a screen and are usually sitting. We're a sedentary society officially by the, by the uh, certain general standards. And with that comes anything that happened to the astronauts. It, it, it's a sedentary lifestyle is deadly. There's a recent paper. It says that sitting is the new smoking is the title from the Mayo Clinic. And he did all the research and the risk is higher with sitting a sedentary lifestyle than with smoking half pack of cigarettes for your life. So things happen and it's important that we accommodate with use it or lose it. Now, what about the brain? Keep moving, remember. So the brain. Well, the brain is not a muscle, but it acts like a muscle in that the more we use it, the better it gets. Now, we didn't think that when I went to Tufts Medical School, it was like that curve. You, your brain gets to be the best. And then after that, it's only about loss. Not true. Isn't that optimistic news? I know most of us are hearing about it. Nola here got her, you can see at 95, her undergraduate degree because she knew she had discovered about neuroplasticity. Neuroplasticity is the lifelong ability of the brain to rewire itself in response to injury or sickness or what we ask the brain to do. This is incredibly good optimistic news. And, the, and it's particularly good because in a nun study where we studied these nuns who lived a very long time and we were studying them for many reasons. And when we did autopsies, not me, but in the study, they found that many of them had Alzheimer brains with the tangles and the plaques, but they didn't have symptoms. So here we go, lifestyle once again, and we know we've already said what it can do with epigenetics, but with this lifestyle, in many cases, you can put off the onset of symptoms for these nuns that never occurred uh, longer and longer with movement. And I'm saying movement, movement that is, uh, those, these are the two things for neuroplasticity. You can actually grow, you grow new pathways with movement so that you get blood to the brain. And the other thing that we need to do is to try new things. Those two things. Now you're doing it with the, with the college, congratulations. So you move, not only those school, I mean, active things, you know, like crafts and languages and, and, uh, and uh, musical instruments. We actually can see the brain changing in, in uh, on scans now where it gets thicker and thicker in areas uh, where, where you're particularly learning, say a physical thing or a language. But it doesn't have to be a big deal like that, although you, you're not afraid, you're taking them on. So congrats again. But it can be small things like say, eating with the opposite hand, get a few more napkins, you can do it. Write it, you know, writing your name every now and then. Putting on your makeup, starting on the other side of your face, shaving on the other side of your face. Uh, scaring yourself, getting out of your comfort zone, scaring yourself. Uh, you don't have to bungee jump, but that's okay if you want to, you know, just do it safely. And we'll talk about risk later on. But trying new things and keeping moving allows the brain to grow new pathways. There was a lady at Harvard, uh, she was a neuroanatomist, Jill Bolte Taylor is her name. She wrote a book called My Stroke of Insight because she had a stroke at 39, huge stroke. She couldn't walk, she couldn't talk uh, and many other deficits, but she knew about neuroplasticity and her story is just remarkable. It took about three, four, five years, but she has a TED talk now, look it up, Jill Bolte Taylor. It's one of the most popular TED talks. You wouldn't think this late, anything happened to this lady. Because she knew about this, she did what was needed and she was able to grow new pathways around the dead area because those brain, those brain cells are never coming back. So very optimistic. Staying connected. We are, we are social people. We need to be connected. We survived because of it. Now I know people are annoying. They can be annoying and they can hurt us and we can get defensive and not want to uh, mix. But you know what? We absolutely need it to be healthy and to experience a healthy longevity. Uh, it is in our very DNA to be connected. Uh, so studies show that people who are connected are two to five times less likely to experience heart disease, 
dementia and cancer, all the biggies, and certainly depression. And if you are not connected, totally different study, different focus, two to five times more likely. That's how important it is. I'll tell you how even more important it is. I have a friend who was a pilot in Vietnam. He was shot down. He was a prisoner for seven years. A lot of it was uh, in solitary confinement and, and, and he was tortured frequently. And uh, he told me in confidence, never mentioned his name, but when they would come to get him in solitary to bring him to be tortured, he, ab- he actually was relieved. He liked that to happen because he didn't like the torturing, but it was less painful than being alone in solitary confinement. You see many prisons are taking solitary off the table now because it is cruel and inhumane punishment. We are not meant to be alone. Got to stay connected. Everything works better. Um, so we can, we can get disconnected as we get older in life. We all know that, you know, friends move on, friends die, spouses. And uh, that is a, it used to be, oh, we just accept that for being older. Well, don't, because this is a major factor. So Stamatis Maritis was a Greek uh, freedom fighter in World War II, and he was wounded and sent to the States to be healed. And he was allowed to stay and he married, had a career, kids, the whole thing. And, um, and then he was diagnosed with lung cancer, told him he was going to die probably within nine months. So he said, "Eh, funerals are expensive here. So he went back to his island in Greece and uh, he got in bed and started to wait to to die and uh, nothing happened. So like a good Greek, he got up and went down to the local taverna and there are all of his friends from childhood. They had stayed on the island, had a great time. This started to be a regular thing. He's feeling good. So he, um, he plants a vineyard. Uh, made 400 gallons of wine after a couple of years. It was an old vineyard. He just renewed it and was working in his friend's olive grove. And um, last time, he, he, he has passed several years ago, but he got up to 102. And uh, he says it's the wine. And oh yeah, maybe it is, but I drink it with my friends. That's the key. Here you go. A good friend of mine has this quote, which I think really drives it home. We're, we are concerned about nutrition. It is very important. At this point, social connection. So I hope you can get together again for your courses so that you can actually be physically present. Technology helps if you're totally alone. You can see your grandkids or others. But what we require, really require, is to be with someone face-to-face, watch their expressions, touch. This is, this is what we had for eons, and this is what is the gold standard for health with social connection. You can't ignore your risks. You know, you wouldn't drive to New York with a lousy brakes or faulty steering, bald tires, whatever. And so you can't ignore the things that could uh, sort of be a curveball for you. And uh, like my story is my father had colon cancer. So I'm at higher risk for colon cancer. So every five years when a guy chases me with a six foot snake, I let him catch me because you know what? I'm not going to die of colon cancer. I may get it, but I won't die because it's treatable, slow grower, and and now it's it's easier to diagnose. So if I do my part, acknowledge the risk, pay attention to it, uh, I will, again, I may get it, but I can, I won't die of it with this diagnosis and, and uh, things like pancreatic cancer, you know, usually is a killer, rarely survive, but people live much, much longer if they can catch it early. Paying attention to risk, go to your doc. And then what you do, you know, uh, I don't want you to not take risks because you should. It's living, it's life. It's, it's uh, you know, it's, it's being all you can be. And, you know, but, but you have to do it judiciously. You have to do it in a way that's not absolutely crazy. And remember this, there are other types of risks. Don't let others put you at risk because, uh, you know, if, you're, if those you love put you at risk, like your family, like um, society, oh, you're old, you're too old for that. You know, you go over here, sit down and uh, we'll open the door for you. We'll do everything for you. Uh, if you let others put you at risk, you're going to buy into that. And that will indeed put you at risk. So again, the people who uh, love you, particularly a family, can be the, the worst offenders and, uh, and make you a, uh, there'll be helicopter kids and you'll be a bubble, bubble grandparent or a bubble parent. 
I had a friend tell me, hey, we just celebrated my mother's 90th birthday. And we had a big party set up in the backyard and she was late. She was still living alone. So we called the house, no answers. Oh, I'll check at the emergency room. And just about that time, she comes down in a parachute for her birthday, right into the yard, you know, tandem. She didn't ask her kids whether that was a good idea, but it was important to her that she do that. So never act your age. Uh, this is the opposite of what you've heard most of your life, because if you do, you're buying into that stereotype that aging is only about decline. And uh, ageism is something that is still around. Maybe it's not as malevolent, but it's ingrained in our, uh, in our culture, particularly in our media. It's getting better and we are gonna change it with the demographics because soon 20% of us will be over 65. And, uh, and you know, Jen's generation there, they, you know, it's gonna be, well, I think we will have settled it by then, but right now it's still there and it's easy to get convinced uh, to play a particular role and marginalized, not engaged and not the role of the elder for time immemorial before the industrial revolution. In fact, in Okinawa, one of the blue zones, they have a thing called ikigai. It's a Japanese word. The closest thing is, is probably engagement or duty, where the older adult knows that they have an absolute responsibility to stay engaged with the other generations and to guide that society. And the society expects it. And again, that's the way it's been forever. Hey, you remember Nola? She didn't, she didn't listen to uh, anyone else. And you know what I mean? A master's degree. And she did. She got her master's at 98. So, yeah. And, and Michelangelo had, has a great quote here. And I, I think this, this just, is, just about says it. Because I think this is rampant with older adults within our society. To shoot too low. You know? And you will hit. Uh, you'll, you'll never hit what you don't aim at. Thoreau said that. And uh, so we, if our expectations are low, we may achieve it, but miss a lot else. This is a big one in our society because uh, our hunter-gatherers, they had stress, but it was usually uh, short-term and it was survival, like a, like a lion in their path or a storm. But we've evolved to a point uh, where, uh, where our higher level brains, uh, where we can generate a flight or fight uh, response. That's a stress response we inherited from our ancestors for survival, but it's meant to be short-term and for us to do something, fight the lion, run away from the lion. And whatever you do, you're gonna do it really, really well, the best you can. May not be enough, but it'll be the best you can. But now in our society and with our brains, we can cause this response in a chronic way. You know, you know, you're not going to be sweating and shaking maybe, but it's a chronic stress that literally eats us from within. We rot from within. We're not geared for the, the, the society that we have built. We're not. And, you know, we got to have to do our best to adapt. But it, it, this kind of stress we weren't built for. I mean, there was no time with our hunter-gatherers. It was sunrise, sunset, weather, the seasons, uh, the moon. That was it. It wasn't no watch. And we're a time dependent, very stressed society uh, with production being the key. And therefore, we have so much chronic disease related to stress, up to $53 billion a year in stress related illnesses. Nearly 80% of all medical visits involve stress in some way. So, what do we do? I mean, it's there. We can't just make it go away, we're generating it. But, you know, we generate it with our chattering mind, our to-do list, looking at the future, looking at the past as something we should have done. Uh, it's a great book, Zebras Don't Get Ulcers, because a zebra attacked by a lion is either going to die or not die. And if he survives, he's out there grazing within minutes. Humans, on the other hand, you know, we're about, we're, what would we do with something like that, being attacked or mugged or something? I mean, it's forever for us, and it, it creates stress. We can't really change that, but we can with things. Uh, well, here's, here's an example. When I give a talk, I usually ask, who's the artist out there? Someone raises their hand. And I said, so what happens to time when you're doing your art? And they said, there is no time. It just vanishes. And I said, how do you feel? I said, oh, I feel terrific. I feel peaceful, happy, joyful even. They're only being mindful. They're not in some altered state. You know, they're just in the present moment, you've heard it, being mindful. This is magical. 
This is the only way that we can deal with the societies that we have built. To have a few moments even, it doesn't take long, we can't always be mindful, uh, but a few moments can stop the momentum that causes so much stress and so much disease. So you can do it with many things, you know, let like this art will do it, crafts will do it, you know, you, you know what it is for you because you've felt it. You say even knitting or, 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 or walking in the woods or being with a pet or um, uh, meditation. Meditation is absolutely uh, designed for this mindfulness. It is, uh, it is, it is in, indeed a joyful state. Again, not because of some magnificent thing happening. It's just being in the moment and not in your chattering mind, worrying about your to-do list and the next thing to do. So again, it may not be what you expected, but let's make the best. You got to have a purpose. We're almost there. Uh, this is Mary Oliver, you know, our Mary Oliver, who lived on the Cape for a while and went down to Florida and has passed. But this is beautiful. And this is something we should ask ourselves every day, every day, no matter what your age. What are, what are you going to do? Because it is indeed a gift. Now, Alvy Date, he's passed, but he was the oldest man in Australia for a while. He got up every day to knit sweaters for penguins. That was his purpose. Now, the penguins had been exposed to oil spills and they preen their feathers, ingest the oil and die. Not when they have these sweaters. That's what did it for him. You get to be 109. And so it's important we find our purpose. You know, we had it when we were younger, you know, it just was sort of put upon us by life. We had to get educated, we had families, we had careers, we did all that. So now what? If we don't have a purpose, we wither. If we don't have a reason to get out of bed in the morning, we're not going to do very well with that as humans. And that is associated with all kinds of in higher rates of disease. Those who volunteer uh, are, have much lesser rate of all chronic diseases and they're happier. And that's just one example. So a purpose that is important to you, whatever it is, it can be small, raising roses or having a little garden uh, or cactus, or it can be big, trying to wipe out you know, world hunger or whatever, but it's important that we have it. But I have found, and, and others agree, that the purpose that really sticks with us as humans is something where we do something for other living things. Now, it can be the planet, it can be plants, it can be certainly humans, creatures, animals, that is, are the things that stick. And, and, and again, we benefit more than anyone we help when we do that, because we are that kind of species. Got to have kids, you know, um, I deal with a lot of people who live in senior living communities and those communities are uh, very enlightened and therefore they ensure that there's an intergenerational contact there. It's absolutely critical. Russian writer Dostoevsky said, the soul is healed by being with children. And it's not only children, younger, younger generations, you know, as we get older, may, there are many generations under there. And remember, we were elders, we were guiders, counselors, wisdom, mentors, very important. So what you're doing, especially if you can go on campus, I love it. <laughs> uh, it just, just dealing with Jen, you know, she's another generation. But I mean, this is so critically important to us and uh, we uh, thrive. And lastly, we laugh. Now, um, Norman Cousins uh, was uh, many years ago, wrote a book called The Anatomy of an Illness and he was diagnosed with a terminal disease. And uh, he was kind of bummed out and uh, he was in the hospital and he said, I, I feel so badly, I, I, gotta, I, gotta, I gotta feel a little better, I gotta get distracted. So he got some Marx Brothers movies and uh, he, um, uh, and he watched though, he, went, he got them and brought them back and he watched those and he laughed and he laughed and he laughed himself into remission for 30 years and died of something else. Uh, physicians, medicine didn't know about it, but we know now this immune system we've been hearing so much about with COVID, that is important for cancer and many other things too. And laughing, being optimistic makes all the difference. People who are half full, you know, the half full people, they live seven and a half years longer than the half empty people. And it's higher quality by definition. There's a centenarian study going on in New England and the most common characteristic of those people who are over hundred is optimism. They said, yeah, I know bad things are gonna happen. I'll deal with them. I've dealt with everything else. I'm just gonna, just gonna enjoy life right now. 
So find the humor. It's there's some in everything, even in COVID. There's a lot of humor, and uh, I've seen it. And uh, in spite of all the tragedy, it's a matter of where you focus. Half full, half empty. Important to laugh. So there they are. There are the ten. You'll be able to get this. It's a recording. And um, don't be on the fence with this. I mean, this is, uh, this is, you know, now you have some information and the important thing is that you do something about it. Like Yoda says, there is no try, there is do or don't do. And so don't be on the fence. You know, here's the information. Uh, again, take small steps, whatever you ch choose to do, whatever you choose to work on, take small steps. It'll get you there because you can make your own path. It's lifestyle. It's your choices. Don't be like these guys. You know, they missed the boat. No, don't miss the boat. What are you waiting for? You know, George Eliot, Marianne, uh, she said it never too late or too early. You know, maybe you wanted to swim the English Channel and maybe you're not going to swim the English Channel, but you can accommodate and swim the distance of the English Channel in a pool over a year. See, see what I mean? That's the kites and thing. So this is, this is true. It is your lifestyle, your choices what you choose to do, how you choose to do it. So keep doing what you're doing, but make sure you're in a place and you're, you're in a situation where you're connected to others in a meaningful way, where you're active both physically and mentally, and where you are fulfilled with meaning and purpose. And lastly, where you're continuing to grow. Now, I know you're doing that, and I know you believe all this, and I hope this is at least a validation of what you're doing, because it is absolutely the right thing. And perhaps we get a little more from it. So I am going to end there, but if you don't remember anything I told you, there's a Tibetan proverb that will do it for you. Do most of what I've said. So it's about lifestyle. Keep it up. It's been a, really a pleasure. And I, I hope, Jen, that we can do this sometime in the future in, in, in person. And I can really see the, meet the people who are, who are doing this because I applaud you. Thanks. Oh, thank you so much, Dr. Landry. This was so incredibly um, illuminating and validating for me in, in many ways, um, and I'm sure for members of our audience. Um, so we will give, give you a moment to take a breath, and then we'll hopefully take some questions from our audience. Um, the thing that really, I just spent, um, I was just on vacation, a family vacation with my fiance and his family and his 86 year old grandmother, she turned 86 while we were on vacation was with us. And, um, actually I'm going to, I'm going to stop the recording because I think we should have the freedom to have a free discussion. And so we'll go ahead and stop the recording now. Um,